Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I apologize, we're running a little bit late. We had an unexpected fire alarm go off in our building at 9.04 this morning. So we have evacuated the building and since returned due to a false alarm, thankfully. <laughs> so we're scurrying around here right now. So I apologize, um, you know, if we're, if we're actually out of breath, quite honestly. Um, but again, I want to thank you all for taking the time to, to join Bear and Purvis to review our what really are our top 10 underwriting questions. They're, they really seem to be the most common ongoing questions that, that we receive you know, from a day-to-day -day basis. And I am Stacy Reeder, the Director of Marketing at Bear and Purvis, and I'm going to be joining Heather Janke, whom most of you are familiar with. She is our lead underwriter here at Bear and Purvis. And we are going to try to make this a short webinar because we know it is an extremely busy time of year. And so we, we've really allotted 30 minutes to go over these 10, uh, these 10 questions. And you know, we will have questions, we know that. So, you know, it could it could expand beyond 30 minutes. But just to let you know how we will address questions during the webinar, you know, just a reminder, everyone is on mute. So we would ask that you submit those questions in writing. While Heather is reviewing the presentation or going through the slides, I will be reviewing the questions <laughs> and then presenting those to her, you know, if they're appropriate based on you know, where she's at in the presentation. Uh, those that, where the timing is off a little, we'll just save those for the end and we'll address them all at once. We are recording the webinar today, so we will put a copy of that in an, uh, a link to the recording as well as the slides. We'll send that in an email to you tomorrow. And then we will also post this information on our website, on our webinars and education page, as we always do. So I am going to go ahead and turn everything over to Heather and we can get started. Heather, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Good morning, everybody. As Stacy stated, my name is Heather Janke. I'm the lead underwriter here at Bureau and Purvis. And today we're going to go over solving the top 10 underwriting questions. We did something similar to this webinar a couple years back. And what's interesting is that although a lot has changed, some things have stayed the same. And so we're going to we're going to go through what has actually changed and where we are in 2014 and what has pretty much been standard. So as we go on, please make sure you type in your questions and we will try to address them all. So let's begin. So basically, this is how we're going to go through as our slides. We're going to go through each question. We're going to have answers to each question on each slide. And at the very bottom of the slide, you're going to see that we have the resources at your fingertips. These are the documents that we have at Bureau and Purvis that we continually update that will give you the answers to each one of these questions by carrier. Okay, so the first question, and this comes up quite a bit, is does my client have to be filed and registered with the state of California? The answer to that is it really depends on the entity type and where you can run into issues with the group is a lot of groups will incorporate outside of the state of California for tax purposes. I think a lot of you have probably seen that when you have a group that's incorporated in Delaware. So California says if you're a corporation or an LLC or an LP, you have to file to do business in the state of California with a secretary of state. And so once a group does that, they will be listed as active on, a Cal on the California business portal. And that just confirms to the carrier that they're eligible to conduct business in the state of California or they have to provide a document from the state of California saying that they have filed and stamped to do business here. I'll tell you the thing about the portal. If you go onto the California Business Portal and look up your group and you don't quite see it yet, the portal takes some time to refresh. They say it refreshes every Tuesday, once a week, but sometimes it takes a little bit longer than that. So in that case, you would just want to get the document from your clients. Um, entity types that don't have to file with the state of California would be a partnership, a sole prop, or an LLP. Uh, those owners are required to provide appropriate tax documentation to prove eligibility. In parentheses there, we have startups with Anthem. Anthem right now will take a startup group, meaning they're brand new, and they're just starting to do business in the state of California, so they don't yet have their legal documents. Anthem has a form 
uh, conditions of startup form that they'll take in those situations. So the information here, you can find whether or not a group is on the portal by looking at the California Business Portal, and we outline legal documents that are required by carrier, by entity, and are bulletproof underwriting guidelines. Okay, next. Question is, how do I determine if a group is guarantee issue? AB 1083 states that a group is, cons is considered GI if they have one to 50 full-time employees for 50% of the previous calendar quarter. As I'm sure you all know now that we're in going into October of 2014, um, it used to be AB 1672 and they required two, but now we go down to one. The tricky thing is, is that in 2014, just as in 2013, each carrier still defines 50% of the previous calendar quarter differently. So for example, Anthem used to have a six-week rule in 2013, and in 2014 they have reverted back to 50% of the previous calendar quarter, as has UHC as has HealthNet if you have one to five eligible employees. HealthNet stuck with six weeks if you have six or more eligible employees. Aetna maintains six weeks. CalChoice is also a carrier that will do six weeks if you have one to five enrolling. Otherwise, CalChoice is a great option for groups that are brand new, that have six or more enrolling, and they have one week of payroll. So I know that's a lot to digest, so I, I'm gonna, this, we have that broken down completely on the medical underwriting guidelines. And then also, an important note is that in 2014, and I think people still get caught up on this, owner-only groups are not eligible for GI. And we're, that actually is gonna segue us into our next question, because what is an owner-only group? For a long time, we've been, it, it has been a non-issue. But if a group that consists only of owners that are not W-2 eligible, or they consist of a husband and a spouse, our carriers said, you're owner only and we won't take you. So for example, Aetna, CalChoice, HealthNet, and UHC, you have to have at least one non-owner, non-spouse, W-2 eligible employee. Our caveat there, again, would be Anthem. Because Anthem says you have to have one non-spouse, one non-owner, W-2 eligible employee or an owner that qualifies as a common law employee. And where this can trip up people is Anthem has their eligibility statement, and on that statement, you are confirming you have a common law employee. So basically, Officer A fills out that form and says that Officer B is his common law employee and vice versa. Officer B attests that Officer A is his common law employee. And in those situations, Anthem Blue Cross will write the group. There's one other caveat to this, and that would be Aetna. And Aetna has loosened up on owner onlys with only one specific entity type, and that would be a C-Corp. If you have a C-Corp, Aetna will take you as long as one owner is on payroll. So <clears throat> in our medical underwriting guidelines, we break down by carrier who will accept a group whether or not they require the W-2 eligible employee, and how the enrollment must be processed. So it's a great resource. And I'm going to show you at the end of this uh, presentation where you can find these resources um, on our website, which is the best place to go, because anytime the carrier updates anything, we update it and post it immediately. Heather, I do have a question in regard to an owner-only group. Mm -hmm. How does this pertain to like families? So if if you know, it's a family, and they're trying to ensure all the family members, and that's all there is. Okay, as, as long as, let's say you have a husband, wife, and three children, as long as the husband and one of the children are the, are the owners of the group, and the wife is enrolling as a dependent, the carriers will accept that. They will allow a dependent child, as long as they're of age, to be... Um, to allow that to proceed, and they will allow it if the other two children are W-2 children. So you can have that as long as it's just not solely focused on the husband and wife. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of confusing. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so question four, who is considered an eligible employee? So again, the law, AD 1083, defines an eligible employee as one that works 30 hours or more per week. 
So full time is 30 hours per week. Part time is less than 30 hours per week, and that's an optional coverage. I will tell you, in 2014, none of the carriers that we represent will allow you to go less than 20 hours for part time eligibility. In the past, Anthem would go to 15. That's no longer available. And then wages play a part in determining eligibility. And this is really big in the Bay Area for all of us especially, because when a carrier is determining eligibility for an employee, it's very rudimentary. They take the hours of eligibility, so 30 or 20, whichever the group's covering, and they multiply that by, min by the minimum wage and then by the number of weeks that are in a quarter, which is 13. And that's how they come up with their number. The reason why it's important a tricky situation for us here is let's say you're going to San Jose and you're going to meet a group in San Jose. Their minimum wage is higher in San Jose and in San Francisco than the regular California uh, minimum wage is. So you may have employees in San Jose or San Francisco that the group is telling you are part-time and they legitimately are because the minimum wage there is much higher. We have in Bulletproof underwriting what the total calculations are for San Jose, San Francisco, and California, the number at 30 hours and 20 hours that the carriers would consider that employee eligible based off the DE9C. So that's an excellent resource considering that minimum wage is continually changing, it seems as though. Okay. So our fifth question, are what carve-outs are allowed? Basically the only carve-out that's allowed anymore is a union, non-union. The carriers no longer allow location, management versus non-management, hourly versus salary. HealthNet initially this year came out and said they would not do union, non-union carve-outs, but they have since changed their stance on that. So you'll see with HealthNet, Aetna, Anthem, and UHC, the total group size must be 50 or less employees, which can be very difficult when you have a union population in your group that tend to be over 50. So CalChoice, <clears throat> requires that the non-union population be 50 or less. So CalChoice will look at a group, if it's union, non-union, that has 120 people in it, as long as the non-union population is 50 or less. So Aetna, <clears throat> so 75 percent of the group for Aetna with a minimum of five enrolled is what they require. Anthem and HealthNet will go down one, you know, one to five, but they still require the participation for the non-union population. CalChoice is 70% of the non-union population, and UHC is really generous, so if you can actually get a union group that's 50 or less, you need a minimum of five enrolling and 25% participation. So they're very flexible there. We outline in our Bulletproof underwriting guidelines um, exactly what each carrier requires for a union non-union carve-out. Our medical underwriting guidelines will basically tell you which, which is allowed, and across the board it's only union, non-union. Bulletproof goes into what documentation each carrier would require to write that group. Heather, can we stop there for a moment? Sure. So are there any carriers that will actually um, take a group that have a carve-out with over 50, a total population in excess of 50? Of the non-union employees, no. What about with under 50 non-union employees, but the total population exceeds 50? So CalChoice would be the only option in that case. Of the carriers we represent, CalChoice is the only one that will allow the total group size to exceed 50 and write the group as long as the non-union population is 50 or less. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Question six, what waivers are not considered valid waivers? So the waivers that we've listed below in the three bullet points um, are not valid with any carrier that Beer and Purpose represents except UHC. So UHC has come out and said they'll essentially take anybody's uh, waiver or declination as valid, and that would be group coverage through Kaiser, individual coverage direct with a carrier, or individual coverage through Cover California. UHC has stated we will find all of those forms as acceptable to prove participation and all you have to do is give us an ID card. All of the other carriers do not consider these valid and then our valid waivers are still standard. It's, you know, 
uh, spousal coverage, TRICARE, Medicare, Medi-Cal, everything that we're used to. UHC is the outlier. So question seven is really a two-part question. We're going to have question seven and then question seven A. And it's about how to, how to meet participation and whether or not your group would meet participation. So one carrier enrollment, if you're just enrolling with Anthem, let's say, or Aetna, and you need to calculate the minimum enrollment, you would basically take the total group size and subtract your valid waivers and multiply that by participation. And that would tell you how many, approximately how many bodies you need to enroll the group to meet that participation. So for example, a group of 16, you have four valid waivers, which gives you 12 times 75. You need nine to meet participation, to enroll to meet participation. If you're trying to figure out the actual percentage of participation that you have, you would take the number of enrolling employees and divide that by the total group size minus the valid waivers. So in this case, we have 10 enrolling. We had four valid waivers out of a group of 16, so it would be 10 divided by 12, and that would give you 83%. On our medical underwriting guidelines in our participation section, we actually break this down with examples for you so that you can see and try and, and apply the test to see if you match. And the reason why we wanted to make this a two-step question is because this is just single carrier participation, one group. We do know that groups still like to have Kaiser. And so participation, how has it changed alongside Kaiser? It changed quite a bit from 2013. So Anthem and HealthNet, they no longer offer an alongside Kaiser portfolio. Standard participation applies, and the Kaiser enrollees are not valid waivers. They're considered declinations. So you would have to meet their guidelines with all of Kaiser being considered declining and accounting against you. Aetna and UHC still allow an alongside Kaiser option. However, they no longer have alongside Kaiser portfolios. So all plans that both of these carriers offer are open, even if you have Kaiser alongside. So Aetna would require a minimum of five California enrollees, not five eligible. You have to have five California employees who are enrolling or 50% of the non-Kaiser, whichever is greater. And UHC also will require a minimum of five California enrollees, or 25%, because that's their participation, whichever is greater. <clears throat> so underneath here, you can see we have the participation section and our medical underwriting guidelines. We have alongside another carrier option, which is also in our underwriting guidelines, and we help you uh, figure out what portfolios are available in that section. And then we also have the Calculating Kaiser Participation section, which helps you by carrier figure out if you're meeting participation for that carrier alongside Kaiser. OK, question eight. What carriers accept groups with 51% or more eligibles out of state? In 2013, we had two. We had Aetna and UHC that would look at these groups. Aetna in 2014 decided that they would no longer consider groups with 51% or more eligibles out of state. So within our carrier offerings, UHC is the way to go. They will still look at groups that have 51% or more not uh, eligibles not residing in California. Their rules are very specific, however. So the group cannot be rated in California if if there's a state that has 51% majority. So basically, it would be rated in the state that holds the 51% majority. If there's no majority state, rating occurs in the state with the largest enrolling population. If multiple states possess the same number of enrollees, rating occurs in the headquartered state. So I want to stop there for a second, because I think we, we run into this a lot with UHC on groups that have 51% eligibles out of state, or 50-50, let's say. So we have run into it where you have a group in California that would have three enrolling, you have, and they have employees in Nevada that have three enrolling, and then they have employees in Washington that have two enrolling, and one in Oregon that has one enrolling. Because Nevada and California both have exactly the same amount, and they're greater than the other two states, they each have three, UHC then reverts to where is the group headquartered. 
So if the group was headquartered in California, that group would receive California rates. If it is not headquartered in California and it's headquartered in Nevada, it would receive the Nevada rates. The one important thing to remember about this is if you have a group and you're going to say it's headquartered in the state of California, UHC requires that it's an actual storefront, a brick building. You can't have a home office and have it rated out of California. So we, we reference this in our out-of-state section area on our medical underwriting guidelines. Heather, let's pause for a yeah. minute. Sure. Okay, so if you are rating the group out of state, would the broker have to be licensed in the the other, I mean, the non-California state? Yes, they would. So you would have to be licensed within that state. And just so you know, those quotes can be submitted through Bureau of Purvis through your SGS. But we go to UHC to have them rating, rate it and return the quote. We can still help you with, with that as long as you're uh, licensed in that state. We can still hold your hand through the process. We can make sure that the correct forms are completed, that underwriting is still processed. We still have a relationship with the people who are going to be working on it at UHC because it, it's broker-based. So although you need to be licensed in Nevada, let's say, California would still work on your group. The people we have relationships would still take care of take care of the group. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I have an actual scenario here regarding the, the out-of-state rule. So, okay. <clears throat> I don't know if you have a pencil or not. You I, might I want do. to write it down. Okay. <laughs> so, if you have three employees in California, three in Nevada, and one in Washington, per se, and the corporate office is located in Washington, where would that group be? be rated? So they would actually they would actually rate it out of Washington because that's where it's headquartered even though that's not the clear majority. Because there's no clear majority it reverts back to where the group is headquartered. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> the other um, bullet point that we want to make you aware of on groups that have to 51% or more eligible out of state is that UHC does have a maximum of 25% that may of the employees that may be located within the state of Vermont or Minnesota. So what are the submission as uh, the submission requirements? This is going to vary by carrier and portfolio. So Always make sure you utilize the carrier submission checklist and the employer enrollment kits that Bureau and Purpose can send you. You can shoot an email over to your sales rep or your SGS, your small group sales assistant, and they can shoot over the e-kits for you. We have um, a checklist both in the employer e-kit and in the employee e-kit just to assist in filling out the applications. And the one thing that you always want to make sure you do is submit current forms because outdated forms are not accepted. And believe it or not, the carriers do continually update their forms. I'll give you an example. 9-1 CalChoice added UHC. And so, or well, actually 8-1, but it was for 9-1 effective dates. And so they came out at the very end of August with a new CalChoice um, employer and employee application to be effective 9-1 that had the UHC plans on there. So if you're not sure if your forms are up to date, please reach out and check with us. Always check our website. We continually update that information so that the most accurate information can go out to you. Okay. So how quickly will I receive a group number following approval? This is actually our last question. Um, all carriers except for Aetna provide the group number with the approval letter. Aetna will distribute the group number within two days of the group approval. This is because Aetna's system has a limitation. And what happens when you write an Aetna group and you receive your approval is in order for Aetna's system to give a group number, the Aetna underwriter has to close out the group, issue final rates, and approve the group. And that, that signifies the system to, to get and generate a group number for the group. It should never follow, uh, follow or take longer than two days to receive the group number, but during that time, Aetna is actually installing your group, so the group is not on hold. It's being installed while the group number is being generated. Sure. 
Okay, thank you, Heather. So I do want to remind everyone. And so I want to make sure if you have any. Okay, I just I want to pause here if we can, um, you know, kind of maybe address some questions before we proceed into where the sure. the resources are located. So we we do have some additional additional questions. Now it, we are stepping back. So just a reminder to everyone: if you do have any questions, please go ahead and submit them in writing. And um, it's all the way really kind of back to the beginning a little bit about the, you know, owner only husband and wife group. So if you have a group with just a husband and a wife, are there any carriers in which they can get coverage? No. We do not have any carriers that will accept them because the way the law is written, the law states that husband and wife groups cannot be written together for benefits. So no, that is the one uh, caveat. So even with Anthem, where they'll accept two owners, they'll only do it as long as it's a non-spouse. Even if they are W-2 eligible? Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so if both owners pay themselves, so if they're both listed on a DE-9C, and they have W-2s, then they're eligible, correct? With Anthem, they are. If it's not Anthem, they're not both eligible unless it's a C-Corp with Aetna. Our, Anthem's really the only carrier that will allow two owners, whether they're W-2 or not, to enroll. And what is happening in the marketplace, just so you're aware, is that on those small groups that are being submitted, a lot of the carriers are coming back and asking for documentation. So they'll come back and say, please provide a copy of the file and stamp statement of information. And they're doing this to audit, to make sure that the, that the two or three people enrolling are truly not owner only. Okay, I know, gets a little tricky. All right, so if we go back to question one, um, question one, I believe, in regard to, I'm sorry, question two in regard to guarantee issue. Yes. So is six, does any carrier still allow six weeks of payroll for start, startups? Is six weeks of payroll still okay for startups? Aetna will take six weeks. HealthNet will take six weeks if there are six or more eligible in the group. So if you have a group of four employees, um, HealthNet will not accept the six weeks. They revert back to the 50% of the previous calendar quarter. And CalChoice will take six weeks if you have one or five, one to five enrolling. If you have more than five enrolling, CalChoice will take a week. So really, Aetna, HealthNet and CalChoice, depending on the number of eligibles and enrolling. Okay, thank you. Give me just one second. I'm looking at, um, at a question. Um, this question is in regard to carve-outs. So um, if you have a group, just to reiterate, if you have a group, let's just say that the total population between union and non-union employees is 100, but the non-union population is 40, the only carrier option in small group medical is California Choice, is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right, I am going to, we do have some additional questions, Heather, but I'm going to go through those while you talk about where, or show where our resources are located. And when you open some of those resources, I actually may have you um, point out the location within them. Um, as sure. we're addressing these questions. Sure. Let me skip to the end here. Okay, so I just want to touch on this slide. I know it was up while we were asking questions at the very beginning of our question and answer session, but feel free to contact VMP Underwriter. You can come to me. I have three other underwriters on my team, Sarah Packer, Berlin, and Tweeson. Um, Please utilize current copies of our Bureau and Purpose resources, and the best place to find those is on our website, on our talk, on our talk tool, sorry, on our pocket tool page. You'll be able to find underwriting guidelines, 
bulletproof underwriting, new business deadlines, and our changing markets. Um, and then also reach out to your sales rep or your small group specialists. But I want to hop over to our website right now and show you in the broker workspace, right here under Bear and Purvis Resources, we have Pocket Tool. <clears throat> and if you click on that, you come over, you see underwriting details. And within here, you're going to see we have our new business deadlines, we have our bulletproof underwriting, and we have our um, medical underwriting guidelines. So here's a copy of our medical underwriting guidelines. I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with this, but just to let you know, we do three carriers across and then we do the, the categories on the side. So the first two pages will be at Net Anthem, Cal Choice, and then the next two pages will be Health Net. And right now, sea change is still on there because they haven't uh, ceased business operations yet, and UHC. We go in alpha order. Let's see here. Oops. Hang on. <clears throat> this, these right here are bulletproof underwriting guidelines. You'll see we have a bookmarked. So, for example, let's go back to where I showed you the quarterly wages. On this page, this is where we have it broken out by California, San Francisco, and San Jose. And you can see what was effective in 2013, what is effective January of 2014, and what is effective July. The reason why we still have January on there is because you may actually run into a group where you need to prove they're under 50 for 50% 50 of the previous calendar year because you can't meet that definition by quarter. So this is just a tool to help you with that. And I'd like to show you carve outs because this has come up. And right here is where we, where we state union versus non-union and the total group size, union and non-union must be 50 or less. So that's where you'll see that. Down at the bottom right here, it'll show you CalChoice total group size union or less may exceed 50 but total union population must be 50 or less. So that's where we mentioned that. I'm actually going to show you this really quickly because I think it's important for you to see it. We have legal document samples on here as well. So if you need to get a legal document for your group, if you're looking at our bulletproof underwriting guidelines and you're looking at a, a sole prop and it says that you need a Schedule C, you can come and see what the Schedule C is. You can see what a K-1 is. You can see what the statement of information looks like. So we have all of that here. So it's a great resource because then you can actually show this to your client. And they may say, oh, yeah, I have that. And this is our new business deadlines. This is updated constantly. Our carriers are extending deadlines. CalChoice extends them quite often. Um, from their initial offering, and the date here is the date that it must be in Bureau of Purposes office. So if you have any questions about whether or not you can still get a group in on time, please reach out to an underwriter, your state, your small group specialist, or your sales rep. Heather, would you mind going back to Bulletproof? I want to... Sure. I want to touch on or point out a couple of yep. things as they pertain to questions that we're receiving. So mm -hmm. can you go back over to guarantee issue? Sure. Okay. So in regard, we did, someone noticed whenever you were showing this, under Anthem Blue Cross, the special note that we have in regard to startups. Oh, okay. Can you touch on Anthem's, what their rules are for a typical group to become GI, versus a startup? Sure. So <clears throat> if you're looking at a typical group and you're going out and they've been in business for a couple years, Anthem wants 50% of the previous calendar quarter to prove GI. So they would want filed and stamped documents um, for 50% of the previous calendar quarter and or a DE9C or payroll for 50% of the previous calendar quarter. Anthem has an option that they have started doing to take startup groups. A startup group is a true startup. So for example, if you have a group that's owner only and they hired a W-2, but they've been in business and they're on the business portal since 2013, that is not a startup. 
Anthem says you cannot hire a W-2 employee for the purpose of getting coverage. However, if you have a brand new group, the officers incorporated in Delaware, let's just say 9-1, you would like to proceed 10-1 with Anthem. You have a couple new employees. You may or may not have started payroll. You may be starting payroll 10-1. Anthem will accept that group. The form that they have is called a Conditions of a Startup Enrollment Form. And basically what it says is that we promise that within 45 days of our effective date, we'll give you 30 days of payroll. And you sign that form and Anthem will take the group. So as long as you're truly a startup, you, have, you don't have you know, somebody in business, you haven't been in business for longer than 50% of the previous calendar quarter or longer than six weeks. If you're truly a startup, and they normally say 30 days or less, because in that time you're not really going to have a lot of documentation, Anthem will take you. So with Anthem, the six-week rule no longer applies, correct? Because it's 50% of the previous calendar quarter. Correct. Okay, thank you. Now, mm -hmm. since we're in Bulletproof, can you, would you mind going to the carve-out section? No problem. So, we had a question, just to confirm, yes. that we do not have any carriers that allow or permit carve-outs for location, management or non-management, or salary versus hourly. Is that correct? That is correct. Our carriers no longer offer those types of carve-outs due to the way the healthcare reform law is written. But they will permit a union, non-union carve-out, and but the rules are going to vary by carrier. Correct. Okay, and then within Bulletproof, we do go through each carrier, correct? And for those right. rules, right? So, and it's, this is also alpha order, so it starts with Aetna. Um, it will proceed to Anthem, CalChoice, and then move on to HealthNet, C-Change, and then, well, we used to have C-Change, and then UHC, yeah. Okay, so now I, I know I am stepping back again to owner-only okay. groups, but if, you, if a group is currently with a carrier, and they are an owner-only group, do you know how those groups are being reviewed or, or managed upon their renewal? Okay, so it is our understanding um, that Anthem is not actively removing these groups. Um, same with husband and wife owner-only groups, they're not actively kicking them off. We were told HealthNet wasn't actively kicking them off either. We just recently found out in the last month that if a group drops to one or, more, or like just one enrolled with HealthNet, they automatically recertify that group, so there's the potential of removing them. Um, Aetna has said that they're not, that if they come across them, they're going to push them out. Um, and then I do know that Kaiser and Blue Shield are, are removing them. They're asking them to leave. Okay, well thank you. So just to kind of go back you know, to the website, if you would, for a moment, just so people can see as far as the various resources, you know, are available on our site, on our website, and we actually make them available in more than one location. The, the, the best place to go is always Pocket Tool, because you're going to find underwriting resources there, you're going to find information on, you know, benefits, our like plan documents, how deductibles accrue, you know, for, for all of our carriers and all of our plans, but then we also have within each section of our website there's a small group section and a large group section where you would be able to access underwriting documents you know within each of those areas as well as well so you're going to be able to find you know our resources through through various locations now um, I do want to remind everyone because Heather it does look like uh, we have addressed all the questions and okay. there aren't any more coming in but I want to remind everyone that we are going to be sending a follow-up email to all of our attendees tomorrow you will receive a link uh, to the present you will receive a copy I should say of the presentation as well as a link to the recording of this and you know all of our resources as we've mentioned several times now, are available on the website. You do need to log in for 
of those resources. And if you do not currently have a password to the Bureau and Purvis website, then you would need to complete the new broker registration form, which is located on the home page of the website. So Heather, if you actually go to the upper left-hand corner and click log out on the website, I'm sorry, upper right, and then go back to the home. See, now in the upper left-hand corner, you see there's the new broker and email registration button. And if you click on that, then that would be the form that you would need to complete. And then you would receive a user ID and password for that would give you access to our website that then will allow you to go on into the small group coding engine. So if we don't have any more questions, then, you know, certainly, <clears throat> Um, and if any come up after the fact, certainly feel free to, to give us a call. You know, Heather listed various, you know, resources available to you. You can always go to Heather, any one of our underwriters, or any of our small group specialists, as well as your sales reps. So I want to thank you again for joining us today, and we'll look forward to speaking with all of you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.